Hello, welcome. Thanks for joining. We'll have a minute to settle in here as everyone jumps into this Zoom. Welcome participants. Thanks for joining us. All right. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining this webinar. We have 90 amazing minutes together here. We're so glad you could join for this discussion. And my name is Chandra Crawford. I'm known for winning an Olympic gold medal in cross country skiing in 2006, founding Fast and Female, a national charity dedicated to empowering girls in sports which I started in 2005. I did my MBA at the University of Calgary and I'm a motivational speaker. I'm a member of Canada Sports Hall of Fame. Today I'm working on my, well, these days I'm working on my hardest motivational speaker challenge of all time. I have four kids under the age of seven. The topic of gender justice in sports is really close to my heart, not only because of the work I've done for girls in sports over the last almost two decades, but uh, sad personal story. Although my younger sister Rosanna and I competed in three Olympics each, our middle brother Jordan struggled to find his place and sadly passed away from addiction six years ago this April. And so it's very meaningful for me to get to be a part of this. I'm a big supporter of Next Gen Men and really believe very deeply that we can create a world where men feel men and boys feel less pain and do less harm. Hey, thank you for being here. You're showing up here sends a clear signal that promoting gender equality and preventing gender-based violence in sports matters to you as well. So what does success look like in our time together? Where are we going on this journey? Three things are gonna happen in this session. So buckle up, you're gonna learn the evidence-based tips, you're going to hear stories of practical examples from our panelists who are using them in the field. And you're going to plan your next steps. This is just a step on this journey that's really not going to end. There's a lot of work to do. So I know you all have notebooks. Let's get your notebooks out, get the top of your paper, write next steps. Okay, this is going to be success at the end of your webinar here. You're going to write down your own next steps. And there's gonna be a lot of great ideas throughout this time together. Some notes on Zoom. You can turn on closed captioning, great feature. That can be found at the bottom of the panel. The captions are auto-generated, but they're pretty close to, uh, to just right. If you have questions and we're here for you, you're here for you. This is uh, so important that you come up with your own questions and share them with us. Please put them into the chat. They're gonna go just to um, our uh, community manager at Next Gen Men, Veronica and I. So put in your questions, put them in early as they come up, because when we go to Q&A, we're going to start at the top. So right when you think of those questions, get them in. If you want it for a specific panelist, put that. If you want it general to all our panelists, put that as well. Shout out Veronica Eilich, community manager at Next Gen Men. She's here in the background, dropping in links that will be of interest to you, but she's also going to send a follow-up email with all the links. I am personally so excited because I want to look for my next step. I'm going to get this beautiful virtual handout where I can click on all the links on the next things I can be learning. As participants, um, you can message us, like we said, in the chat. So if there's any technical difficulties, you can't hear someone, you can tell us. There's going to be a recording. It's going to be sent out to you after, to everyone who registered. Here's the agenda. We're going to introduce our topic, so we're all on the same page of some of the definitions. We'll move into the panel discussion. Our superstar panelists have different approaches in their work in sport, and they're going to tell us stories. I think this is going to be the juiciest part of the webinar is when we get to hear how an evidence-based finding was applied with real teams their impact on individuals, teams, organizations, exactly what you're here to do, make an actual difference. And then of course the Q&A where you're invited to ask your specific questions. 
We'll wrap up. We'll let you know how you can keep in touch. You will write your next steps and uh, you'll make plans to take, continue taking action like you are today. Let's do a poll. Let's see who's here. Who is in the room? Let's take a couple minutes to fill out this audience poll. You can let us know how you identify your role in sport, how familiar you are with these concepts. Um, that'll give us a good baseline, the panelists and, and our team here. While you're polling away, I'll give you the uh, definitions and background we need to be all on the same page. Sound good? So what is gender justice? There are many ways to define gender justice. So it's important that we understand how we're using this term together. For us, gender justice is the actions we can take that will both lead to gender equality and reduce, ultimately eliminate gender-based violence. And we'll define each of those. What is gender equality? Well, picture a world where everyone can thrive regardless of their gender, <clears throat> gender expression or sexual orientation. They can live their life to the fullest. What is gender-based violence? According to Women and Gender Equality Canada, <clears throat> excuse me, gender-based violence is violence based on someone's gender, gender expression, gender identity, or perceived gender. Gender-based violence can also happen as a form of social punishment for breaking the rules about gender. For instance, violence against queer and trans people might be directed at them for expressing themselves in ways that are inconsistent with existing gender expectations. For instance, someone whose body appears to be male wearing feminine clothes. As another example, instances of violence against women have sometimes been framed as punishment for not being submissive. They're performing gender the wrong way in, in this instance or this view. Gender-based violence is also a useful lens through which we can see patterns of violence related to power. Like, how does this all work? It's about power. Whenever a group of people is systematically disempowered, they're increasingly targeted for violence. For example, women are four times more likely than men to have been sexually assaulted at least once since age 15. 30% of women versus 8% of men. That's from StatsCan in 2020. Also from StatsCan, Women living with a disability are significantly more likely than women without a disability to have been sexually assaulted since the age of 15. That's 39% versus 24%. And self-reported data collected in 2018 indicates that Indigenous women were more likely than non-Indigenous women to have been sexually assaulted at least once since age 15, 43% versus 30% respectively. It's really serious how what we're working on today um, escalates out there in, society, in the world. Women, people with disabilities, Indigenous people, newcomers, queer and trans people, undocumented migrants, people of color, children are all groups who have had power stripped away or withheld from them, which is increasing their vulnerability to violence. And a really important lens that we will be talking about today is how we can look at violence between men. How often is violence between men connected to proving who is the man? How often is it about establishing dominance hierarchies by attacking one another for being too much like a girl? Verbally, physically, and we've all experienced so much of this in sport and I know we're all here to work to change that. Why work with men and boys to achieve gender justice? because most men and boys do not want to hurt themselves or others. I think of my little brother and how tragically his life ended. They don't want to be or feel like, even feel like they're part of the problem. How does it feel to be a man and feel blamed? They want to be part of the solution. So let's create those opportunities. Despite not wanting to be part of the problem, most violence is still committed by men. So if we want to do something to prevent it, it's important to work with men and boys to encourage healthy development, support, support them in taking on positive pro-social roles and identities, maybe even be allowed to have feelings. Boys and men are also harmed by restrictive gender norms. They deserve the safety and freedom to be their truest selves and the deeper relationships and increased well-being they could have as a result. Lastly, the burden of repair and preventing harm shouldn't fall 
just to women and gender diverse people. When we want to go far, we go together. Let's get into a strong why. Excuse me. Permanent cold because I have four kids. Why work towards gender justice in sports? Hey, we love sports. Sport is amazing. It's transformative. It gave me so much in this life. You know how important it is for young people. I feel so deeply frustrated when I think about groups missing out on sport participation and all it has to offer, resiliency, coachability, teamwork, leadership. That's what drove me personally to, to run that national organization in uh, for girls to keep girls in sports. I was babysitting a nine-year-old girl named Emily who told me, um, it looks like it sucks being a girl. You don't get to do skateboarding and you have to worry about makeup. And I set out to prove her wrong. His sport isn't actually good or bad. It's how we experience it. And it's up to us to make the safe, healthy environments. We have our leaders in sport here today. Everyone here is a leader in some capacity in our circles. We want sports to be a safe, welcoming place where the athletes of all genders and sexual orientations are safe and can be authentic, have fun and grow, access all the benefits. We want to support our athletes to be compassionate humans on and off the field, rink, hill, pitch, their role models to their peers and their communities and coaches, what an influential role in the lives of young men. Sometimes a male coach, if you have a young boy and it's all all his teachers are or women for example the first male role model he might encounter other than his dad or maybe not even his dad will be a coach a coach is a huge influence and coaches are so poised to positively influence how young men think and behave sports especially team sports require a certain amount of conformity we have to be a team, group cohesion, and create a culture for our team, connection, that's so important. But then the question becomes, what are the group norms that our athletes are conforming to? How are we creating healthy, positive, pro-social cultures in our teams? That takes intentional work. That's like a garden that you have to keep nurturing, giving sunlight, and weeding. And you know, we appreciate work ethic in sport. We appreciate the, the, you know, the constant 24 hour athlete grind that it takes to make something happen. Let's do that with our cultures in our teams. It's totally worth it. So many young men and boys are socialized to play sports and many of their role models are famous male athletes. There's a lot of role modeling already happening. How can we leverage that? We'll hear about that very specifically from our panelists. Role modeling, it's just the shortest shortcut. You just see it. You can do it. We can be all role models in our actions. We can make this cycle a virtuous cycle, healthy environments, healthy athletes. There are vicious cycles and there are virtuous cycles. Here's a diagram. Let's invest in you today. You invest in yourself today. You're a leader. Creating healthier leaders creates healthier athletes, healthier environments, very interconnected. We're gonna pause and take three deep breaths together and just become present here. <sighs> Settle into this webinar, put away your phone <sighs> and join us mentally, physically, just checking in because we gave a lot of definitions and now we're gonna get into uh, defining the, telling about the project and then introducing the panelists. All right, present. What is Pathways and why does it exist? Pathways is a project funded by Women and Gender Equality Canada and supported by Next Gen Men. The goals of Pathways is, one, connect experts and practitioners like our panelists with community leaders like you, hungry for change. Two, build a bridge between academic research and the leaders in our communities. Can we just say thank you? to everyone putting this together so you can, so that you, the leader, don't have to go sift through tons of academic research or reach out to people in academia. This is a really uh, valuable service. So our panel discussion today is based on the research from SHIFT, the Project to End Domestic Violence. Fantastic report. Print it out, put it on your desk, put it on your wall. Um, there's 
a lot of valuable, there's 26 valuable calls to action in there. And third, the goal is to rally leaders and experts. That's what we're doing. Here we are rallying. And four, we're going to increase the number of people, but especially men doing gender justice work where they live, play, worship, introducing them to entry points where we can all help do this work. So let's introduce today's panelists. Welcome to, uh, we have almost 100 participants in here. Hello, everyone. If you've just popped in, you're right on time for the panelists. All of our panelists have been working to engage men and boys in sports settings to be change makers. When it comes to creating safer, healthier, more equitable sports cultures, they've had the experience. They try the different methods. They know what sticks. So here we go. Ninu Kang, Executive Director of the Ending Violence Association of BC. Hi, Ninu. Welcome. Great to have you here. Please join us with your video and tell us why does gender justice in sports matter to you? Wow, <clears throat> thank you so much for uh, bringing us into this room in such a good way and and what and, and thank you uh, for just you know bringing such a ton of knowledge in so we can all start from the same place. So really, really appreciate it. I'm in Victoria. Beautiful day here in Victoria, sitting in a hotel room. So happy to be with everyone. Welcome and thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Um, me, I'm, um, you know, I'm, I, I always start by, I was born in India. I came when I was 10 years old to Canada um, and I didn't speak English. Uh, and uh, it was really hard to sit through classes when you did. My one dear teacher, Miss, Miss Anderson, who I will always remember, took me to the gym and said, you're tall, you should sit, play basketball. And that was the beginning and sort of the beginning of a long life career and went on to play on the national basketball team. And one of the things I love about sports and what, um, you know, what all of you who are engaged in sports, coaches, leaders, yourself, it's the influence you have on individuals. I mean, I was somebody that really, I, I could have been that one person in the corner that nobody would notice and I wouldn't say a peep. And I would just pretend I spoke English when I really didn't. And I would pretend I understood when I didn't. And sports was one thing that allowed my mind and my body to be used without being discriminated. And so I guess I just, just as a quick introduction, you know, long career, ended up on the executive director of this provincial organization where we support over 300 anti-violence programs. So in all of our province, uh, we have over 300 programs survivors can go to to seek support. So at Ending Violence Association, I have the great pleasure of working with an amazing team uh, where we su support, the, uh, support those individuals that are doing the frontline work. But what's cool about what I brought brings me here today is which I'm happy to talk more about later, which is our Be More Than a Bystander program. It's this amazing program that we started about 13 years ago with the BC Lions. And uh, yeah, I, I'm so giddy about sharing more of that with you in a few minutes. Wonderful. Absolutely thrilled. What an amazing personal story. And we can't wait to hear all about the Be More Than a Bystander program. Thank you so much, Ninu. Next, I'm going to introduce Rick Walters, ambassador and trainer with Be The Voice, former CFL player, a coach, and the director of strategic stakeholder outreach for Alberta Culture. Hi, Rick. Why does gender justice in sports matter to you? Hi, Chandra. How are you? Hope all is well. Um, joining you from beautiful, balmy Edmonton, Alberta, um, in, uh, in of all places, my basement today. So don't judge me for being in my closet in my basement. Um, sport, gender, uh, gender justice in sports and, and, and why it matters to me. Uh, I've had the fortune of being around sports all my, all my life. Um, I had the fortune to play in the Canadian Football League for 11 years um, and then went on to have proceed to go and, and continue to coach at all levels from um, uh, in, in a whole bunch of different sports from from Mike to Bantam to uh, currently I, I coach at the University of Alberta as well. Um, and one of the things that um, I've had the fortune fortune and I say that fortune I have the fortune of having four or sorry, having three daughters. Uh, and so uh, with my three daughters, um, uh, I, I think it's, it's 
uh, it's been paramount for me just um, uh, two things. One, to be able to give back to, uh, to, their, uh, to their enjoyment and love of sport and, and to, to support them as much as I can um, uh, within whatever ways possible from, from coaching aspect to, to just some of the mental aspects around sport. Uh, and then from a, from a gender equality standpoint, making sure that uh, uh, they're able to have certain, certain things that sometimes um, there's a little bit of a inequality in, in things that I was able to have growing up, uh, making sure that uh, they're able to have all the accesses and all the supports around what that looks like. So um, it's funny how uh, when, you, when you have kids, you, you realize how, uh, how much you'll give to, to whatever uh, that looks like to to make sure that they they're enjoying what uh, what they do and and, and having um, um, a lot of fun and growing with it as well. So, uh, looking forward to today uh, talking about uh, all the all the different components that uh, that hopefully I can uh, bring some uh, uh, some thoughts on as well. So, uh, yeah, in a nutshell, that's kind of me. Fantastic. I saw one of the, the speaking on a video on YouTube as well about ambassadorship and just, uh, you know, really, really resonates how much you are able to give to, to the cause and, and I appreciate your, your deep why as well. I, I feel that as well with my kids, like I would rather um, watch them learn a skill than go do, you know, like downhill skiing or some sport myself like it's so fun to watch them I have those light bulb moments and push their limits or whatever it is hey yeah so, absolutely so yeah, rewarding yeah. cool and next we're going to introduce Jacob Priest project facilitator for the sexual assault support center of Waterloo's male allies program total expert what does gender justice in sports uh mean to you Awesome. Well, yeah, thanks for, for having me today. Um, yeah, I work with the Sexual Assault Support Center of Waterloo Region. Uh, I'm one of our educators in our uh, male allyship program. Um, and I do want to acknowledge the land I'm on uh, to start this out, um, which is the Haldeman Tract. It's the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the neutral peoples. Um, and uh, we always talk about this when we start our sort of conversations because it's really important to, to draw the connections between sexu sexual violence and gender-based violence and ongoing colonialism in the country. Um, so with that said, um, our, our center has been working uh, since 2008 uh, with men in our community because we recognized, you know, we, we offer uh, counseling for survivors of sexual violence and gender-based violence. And we recognized that there was a really important um, opportunity to sort of uh, bring that conversation to men and how men can sort of be active in preventing gender-based violence around them. Um, and for me personally, you know, as a teen, I played sports. Um, I, definitely not at the same level as some of the other folks here. It was high school sports, local, you know, community sports. Uh, but I've been in a locker room. I've seen what goes on there, um, both as somebody who, you know, was harmed, um, but also somebody who's caused harm in those in those situations. Um, so it's sort of like understanding that sort of the culture around sports that that exist, and how important it is for for us to create spaces for guys to talk about what is happening for them as they're getting older, as they're going through things, um, and. And sort of acknowledge, and I guess one of my favorite parts about doing this work is uh, bringing a conversation to guys, sometimes for the first time for them, that they can, for example, have emotions other than just anger, um, that they're allowed to feel things, they're allowed to step outside of stereotypes of, of gender that were sort of um, forced into by society. Um, and especially the time where there's a lot of you know, stuff out there, especially online, where folks are sort of doubling down on misogyny, um, where we have very well-known men talking about how women should be seen as private property as a way for men to care about things like sexual violence and how problematic that is. And so for me, these conversations are about challenging uh, a lot of those, those aspects. Um, and especially when a lot of men are feeling lost um, in like, how do I be a man in today's world? Um, for me, this is an opportunity to sort of engage with them um, in those conversations. Um, and I think just finally wanna highlight that, you know, there's a connection between gender justice, whether it's in sports or anywhere else. And um, 
you know, gender-based violence that happens out in society um, this week. Uh, I've been reading through their recommendations that are coming out of the mass shooting that happened in Nova Scotia a few years ago. And one of the things that they highlight is how gender-based violence and how gender-based violence that is not talked about or not dealt with in those communities uh, leads to the, that those violence, uh, instances of violence happening. So for me, it's all, you know, a big thing. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it speaks to what our goal with the web webinar is as well of let's simplify things so we can take action, but also what you're touching on the complexity, mm -hmm. which I really appreciate. And also, you know, how meaningful it is to do, be doing this work. So just hats off. Thank you so much. Thanks. Our final panelist to introduce is Dr. John is a researcher, facilitator, author, speaker, and co-founder at Blueprint. Absolutely check out Blueprint uh, if you haven't already. And hello, John, thank you for joining us. Why does gender justice in sports matter to you? Well, first of all, uh, Chandra, I want to join in uh, thanking you for uh, setting a great table and the good work you're doing and to Next Gen Men for uh, hosting this today and, and my other panelists. I'm really glad you asked that question because it got me to thinking, why am I so committed? What, what is really the story behind that? And uh, I think most of all, um, I grew up uh, in the 1960s with a single mom who was in the, working in the corporate world in a time when there weren't a lot of women in that world and there weren't a lot of single divorced moms. Uh, I really only knew one other kid growing up who had uh, you know, only one parent in the home. Today, of course, as you know, it's commonplace. And as a young man, it, it, you know, I had no idea what my mother's experience was in the world of work, in this world of men. And it wasn't until she was quite uh, elderly before she died in her 80s that she finally shared with me some of her experiences in the world of work, the uh, unwelcomed, uh, unwanted advances, the misogynistic comments, the opportunities she didn't get and was passed by for and on it goes. And I found two things. One is I was really sad that as a young man, I didn't know what my mother was going through. And of course she shielded me from that. But it also got me angry, uh, you know, that uh, not only my mother, but perhaps my two daughters even today, uh, and how many women and other genders and other sexual persuasions and anyone who's different in a whole variety of ways uh, wounds up, wind up not having justice. So I've always cared about it. And I think that's where this passion for this particular issue comes from. And the passion for sport, you know, uh, my wife, who is a high level competitive athlete, always says, John, you're you're athletic, but you weren't an athlete, which is true. But I played on uh, uh, baseball teams in high school and university. I played on this tennis team uh, as well and basketball in high school. And what occurs to me is that um, while I felt like so much time was spent in all my experience in sports around skills, and there was so much focus on winning and getting better on the field or on the court, but I think of the lost opportunity to have made us, especially as young men, more honorable citizens, not only for others, but on every team we were on, including our own. And so that's all of that is part of what led me six years ago to co-found at the University of British Columbia Blueprint, uh, which is, uh, as far as we know, the only university-based program uh, in the world uh, that is does no uh, courses. We don't have a gender studies program. All our work is out in the world to really improve the integrity and well-being of men for the benefit of families, communities, and the world. And we've done a lot of work in sports. We'll talk about that later in the protective services, the military and fire and police, as well as in business. So I'm excited to be here, uh, both for what's possible for um, gender justice and also what's possible for sport to become truly a vehicle to help all athletes, including young men and boys, become better human beings and better for themselves. So great to be here. Oh, yeah. And you're in those trenches, if you will. And I feel your belief and conviction, I think, giving strength to the other hundred of us here on the Zoom. Um, you know, you're there doing it. And that means a lot. And we're going to hear how. <laughs> Thanks Thank so you. much, Thank John. You.
Fantastic. Wow. We will be leveraging Shift's 2022 report. Who's read the report? Calling in all men, 26 recommendations for engaging and mobilizing men to prevent violence and advance equity. That's the basis of our discussion today. Uh, like I said earlier in the call, everyone's going to print this huge report at work, and put it on your desk and put some pages on your wall and uh, continue referencing this great resource. You could dog ear up your whole thing, but we're gonna touch on a few of the big recommendations today. As the title implies, this report shares different approaches and recommendations and our panelists use this practically speaking in their work. Let's hear how they do it. 26 recommendations is a lot. So you'll get the full report. Uh, actually, it'll be one of the email links after our webinar today. So you can check out all the ones we don't go through in depth, but let's get down to it, starting with the bystander approach. We're going to ask Ninu. Uh, so from the report, Ninu, the bystander-based initiatives, sorry, bystander-based initiatives build bystander self-efficacy to take action when they see potentially harmful interaction. I'm sure everyone can think of some time, even in the last week, when something was said and it's so much more comfortable to let it slide. And that's what we're going to be changing. We're going to have a way to potential to when we see that potentially harmful interaction we can mitigate or prevent language or behavior that's inappropriate hurtful abusive or dangerous so a great example when it says if a teammate but we'll put when a teammate <laughs> makes a sexist homophobic or racist joke it's a joke uh, that teammates will find the way to intervene and say hey man it's really not okay to say that uh, without you know losing status or becoming a target themselves. The bystander approach equips every teammate to intervene when they see or hear things that are harmful rather than letting it slide. So more than one of our panelists use this approach and uh, Nina, you have this longtime partnership with the BC Lions, delivering the Be More Than a Bystander program. How do you use the bystander approach in your work? What's the impact it's having? I'll unmute you. Hang in there, buddy. We got to unmute you. There we go. There we go. We'll figure it out in a minute. Okay. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, I, I I think I just want to thank Jacob, John, and um, you know Rick as allies to our work as women in this field. Um, I can't stress that enough. And all of you, the panel, you know, all the participants who are here and attentively listening and and trying to figure out how you can take things away. Um, just, a, just, I want to back up a little bit. Um, as someone who's been in this field, um, dare I admit, uh, 35 plus years as a feminist uh, in the community, um, one of the things I didn't share is that when I got into my career, I started working for a nonprofit organization, mainly working in the settlement of new immigrants and refugees. And it became really important to me to understand the intersection between gender-based violence and what immigrant and refugee women were experiencing. And so, you know, throughout my whole career, um, I had um, clinical practice uh, providing treatment program for men who had used violence and who'd gone through the justice system. So one of the things I didn't get a chance to share earlier is that I spent 30 plus years in rooms with about 12 men with another male facilitator for a six month program, you know, three hours a week, fairly intensive work supporting men after they had used violence in an intimate partner relationship and you know providing all the education we've been speaking about which is what it means to be a man where did you learn this what are you gaining from it what, what are you losing from it and all of that stuff that i did my 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 30 plus years it became really important to me that we needed to get ahead of the game we needed to get ahead of talking to healthy men, if I can use that term loosely a little bit, if you'll allow me to use that term loosely, um, that if I can, uh, men who um, are, are not using violence, um, you know, perhaps uh, unintentionally, they're participating in patriarchy and they're participating in misogyny, but they don't want to, they want to live a life with women, with non-binary folks, with, with colored folks, with, you know, trying to understand what it means to be on these lands with indigenous people through reconciliation and all majority of us majority of us are trying to find that sweet spot 
that's what we're all looking for. And so for the partnership with BC Lions, what was really cool for us is that we wanted to get men to stand next to us. And so my predecessor, uh, Tracy Porteous, who's the founding executive director of Viva BC, it was actually her vision. I was working at another NGO at that time and I kind of, she called me, we talked about it. And, you know, we were so thrilled that the BC Lions just came on like States, Jackson Katz, who talks a lot about the Be More Than a Bystander program. And we brought him in to train the players at that time, 12 plus years ago. And, you know, when uh, now we go out to do this work and uh, our facilitators who are ex BC Lion players, um, you know, just, um, just who, who actually talk about how their locker locker room changed and one of the things they talk about was that you know they saw as athletes as professional athletes in their locker room on the field you know they were in a sports football you know it's all about okay like the louder we can be you know we can be more pumped and we can really then go out and win and they really talked about and um, Angus Reed and our our dear colleague J.R. LaRose um, who, who does still do a lot of work with us talked about how they won you know, how they, they, they won the Grey Cup. They actually won after they brought this program in, right? And, and it's just such a testament to the fact that if you change the culture, and they talk a lot about that when they took the training, uh, you know, they were, they were sort of like little sheepish about it. Like, how are the others going to think about that? Like, are we going to lose that masculinity? And are we going to become weaker athletes? And are we going to now start losing football because um and so you know they talked about the apprehensions that many folks had at that time but their leadership and that's a really important thing to remember that the bc lion leadership was bought in and so when the players and the and the managers when they saw that the leadership was bought in it was a trickle down effect you know it really was that everybody was sort of like yeah if you're not doing this you're not cool right and so I think part of this be more than a bystander program does start with leadership and also what I also the last thing I'll say because I want to give space to my other um, you know co-participants to come in but the last thing I want to say about this for now is that if you are joining this movement um, it's important to understand what you gain from it because because what we're all really trying to do is make connections and so and and majority of the people are feeling uncomfortable but that's how we grew up we grew up sort of like oh my god if I say something someone will be like you're not cool what's wrong with you you're just you don't get what's going on and and you're going to be that one person remember my my identity I talked about being that one person who didn't speak the language and was in the corner I mean that's an image and an experience many people feel that if I say something I'm going to be that one person that's going to be put in the corner um, but actually when you start doing it and enough people start doing it then it's actually the joke tellers that are the ones that are put in the corner. And, and I think that's the transformative thing about being more than a bystander. And so, um, you know, I don't want to take up too much space. I want to share the space with my colleagues as well. So I'll stop there. I know everyone listening is um, thrilled to hear that result and how the apprehension was managed. That's something very tangible and really calling on leaders here in the room to embody that that confidence that this is the, the direction we're going and how that makes a difference. Sounds like it's really very exciting how it can work. Uh, another approach that fits in well with the bystander approach is the practice of calling in. And calling in is a term credited to Nok Lon Chen, who is a Viet mixed race, disabled, queer writer and educator based in the Southern US and has the practice of inviting people, organizations who are causing or have caused harm, similar to your experience, you know, uh, to bring them into the conversation with learning and growth and calling in fosters an environment in which people are more likely to be receptive and have an opportunity to grow. It provides clear and appropriate feedback in a two way conversation, and it starts from this place of hope that change is possible. Calling in is a concrete strategy, though. It can shift the conversation from men as an inevitable part of the problem to an essential component of the solution when it comes to gender justice. It makes complete sense. Let's hear how we do it in practice. 
John is going to tell us a bit about how he uses calling in when working with sporting organizations, what those results were, how did you do this, John, and what was the effect? Yeah, first of all, thanks, Chandra. Uh, and, uh, you know, just an interesting point on the bystander piece. One of the points that uh, keeps men and boys from being more than bystanders is the belief that other men or other boys um, don't share their views. When we did our major study, a biggest study of its kind last year on how the workplace has changed post Me Too, one of the most interesting finding is that most men believe that other men are more misogynistic than they see themselves. So what that means is, as one guy said when we talked about challenging those comments that we all think shouldn't be made, he said, well, yeah, we do that, but you don't want to be that guy because the perception is that you're the only one. So when we help men connect, first of all, to each other, they begin to realize many other men share my conviction. Like in our study, where over half of men in Canada said they were committed to and wanted to speak out more actively uh, for gender equality, but also gender justice. But this idea of calling in is so important um, because uh, people, if they haven't read the study yet, well, what is calling in? To me, what calling in is, is, is giving people an opportunity to hear the experience of others different than themselves. So for example, for uh, you know, self-identified males to hear the experience of other genders and of uh, self-identified females. Uh, for uh, white people to hear the experience of people of color or indigenous people. And in our study in Me Too, what was really interesting, and then I'll get to sports, is that we found when we asked men in particular what interventions were most effective at, at growing their commitment to gender equality and justice, that the most profound experiences were where they actually got to hear the experience of other genders and other races when they actually heard in their words. And I was thinking of an experience that we had two experiences that fit this in our programs with athletes. And we do a lot of work at the university level with athletes, male athletes in particular. But I remember one session we do, we had both gen, you know, all genders there. And uh, when, when we got to the issue of sexuality, the men hearing how female, the female athletes experience sexuality, being sexualized, of safety, uh, things they worry about. And for the men, it was like scales fell from their eyes, actually hearing the female athletes tell them what it's like to be a female athlete and period to be a woman in, in society. One more experience that shows the power of calling in. We had the privilege a couple of years ago to do our Good Men in Sport program with the West Point Army football. Now these are all men. But it's, it's about 50% uh, uh, black athletes and 50% you know, white athletes, more or less. And one of the most profound experiences was when the, we created a space for the black athletes to simply tell their, their uh, teammates about the everyday experiences of racism they, they experienced growing up, but to this day on campus at West Point. And even though the, the white athletes had heard about racism, many of them were, you know, they, they, they didn't see color when they saw their teammates, they just saw people. The experience, Chandra, was so profound from the calling in. And I would contrast that with what would have happened if someone came in and said, look, you white athletes, you need to be advocates for, you know, for racial justice. Let me tell you, you know, what uh, your uh, Black teammates experience, hearing it in their own voices, it opened them up. And I, we found that same thing with the female athletes. So I think calling in is a powerful way because, you know, there's an old saying about hate. It's hard to hate up close. It's also hard not to care about justice, whether it's gender or race, when you hear it up close. So I think it's a powerful tool. We use it in our work. And I think we need to do more of it, to be honest, in the work we do with men and boys in particular. Very, very tangible sharing the stories. Uh, I'm calling to mind as well, if because you, you're creating a forum, leadership has to do this. 
no one else is going to make this happen. And even if you're going to watch a documentary or read or listen to a podcast, you know, leadership has to be uh, putting this in front of our eyes and speaking from my own white fragility, you know, sitting in my discomfort, encountering, looking at my privilege and all the impact and harm. You, you need to be, you know, going towards it and you need to be going towards this um, discomfort as a valuable part of the process. So I can see also how creating the environment, let's do this leaders and ourselves individually. Fascinating and, and, you hearing know, the stories. Sandra, just one more interesting thing. Mm. You know, we did that put uh, several thousand firefighters now in British Columbia through a resiliency program, mostly men because most firefighters are men. But of course, women and other genders are in the program. One of the most profound changes among the men is when they hear their female colleagues talk about what it's like to be a woman in the fire service. How the men can cry and it's okay. When the women cry, they're weak and not strong. Again, the, the sexual uh, uh, things that go on that are not appropriate. And the men for the first time, they may know about this, but suddenly when they hear the impact from a colleague who they value up close, everything changes. So we've seen this in all our programming, the, the value of calling in. Wow. So you're in, you're in a forum, the female firefighters going to get up on that microphone and tell you what it's like? Is that, that's awesome. Yeah, well, actually, these are much more intimate groups, which is okay. a group of okay. 15 or 15 okay. people where it's even more profound because you've been with these people for a couple of days. Okay, okay. We're not just uh, throwing this on the no. training camp. No, uh, agenda. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> more thorough. And that's why we have you resources. And I think if you can do West Point Army football, surely all of our sports cultures, I found Nordic skiing incredibly misogynistic. Well, they're all, it's like, that's what we're swimming in. So, but if you can do this with uh, West Point Army football, I, I take a lot of hope that we can do this in our own um, sports and teams. Holy smokes. Let's go to social norms, the social norms approach. We're going to call on Rick. Social norms. Our rules or expectations for how to behave. They're shared by a group. They're maintained by social pressure. Social punishment rewards can be very subtle. Can be eyes, can be a moment, a beat of silence. It's, Homo sapiens are incredibly wired for these subtle social cues and we're very good at adapting to them. For example, maybe it's common within a team's culture to expect teammates to participate in hazing, to not tell adults what's happening. So the two main types of interventions for social norms are one, those that aim to correct misperception about misperceptions about the norms, and two, those that work with key influencers to disrupt harmful norms, promote more adaptive ones. So maybe this involves working with the team to identify what they actually want their team culture to look like. Maybe it involves working with team members who have lots of influence over their peers to set new norms. Be the voice uses social norms approaches in their work. Rick, how is that approach working in practice? How do we go about changing teams, organizations, social norms? Um, thank you. Uh, and I'm loving listening to everybody's uh, comments as well. Uh, social norms, I think one of the, if I'm looking for an example in, in, uh, in lives, in my life that I can, uh, uh, bring to the, bring to the table, it, it would, a lot of it would be in, in a, in a football, locker room. Um, one, one of the things you look at is uh, there are negative experiences and there are positive experiences that you're going to have happen within that. Um, and one of the things that you can, you start to look at is uh, how can we help to reduce or help to increase? Uh, it's always, the experiences are always based and you start to allude to it a little bit, are always based on leadership and culture and how that is established within, within the group's um, uh, dynamics. Uh, and what that looks like. You're going to have a positive uh, environment and, and a positive uh, leadership group and a, and a positive culture. And at the same time, um, uh, in, you can have a negative leadership group and, and negative culture within that. Uh, one of the one of the neat things that um, that I haven't talked about too too much yet, uh, but one of the in, in my in my current role now, I am director for uh, strategic stakeholder outreach, which is a 
which is a provincial, an area within a provincial ministry. Uh, so within culture in, in government of Alberta. And so one of the great things that we had the opportunity to do was to support um, uh, support an organization called Voice. Uh, and what Voice was able to do uh, with, with the help of their executive director, Colin Puri, uh, they were able to, to understand and use sport um, uh, because sport is a really powerful and cultural influencer. And, and, and so it was an entry point uh, to building a community of, of champions, really uh, dedicated individuals um, that were trying to support ending gender-based violence. So what Voice was able to do was realize that that um, individuals had had a powerful voice. Uh, so they were able to to work with ambassadors. So the ambassadors are influencers, whether they be um, uh, CFL athletes, um, whether they be uh, NHL players, uh, youth sports athletes, uh, whether they be uh, all kinds of different athletes, uh, female volleyball players, uh, and so using their power and influence, they were able to work on leadership and culture within within high schools within junior highs and so they meet with on a regular basis and one of the big pieces that they look at it it had to be ongoing um uh longitudinal basis to to help make a difference it wasn't one-off one-off meetings or one-off presentations but it was over a long term they're able to work through eight to ten modules with a group of anywhere between 30 to 40 individuals at a time um, and work on just what I talked about earlier, work on what, what the leadership aspect uh, is within that group, work on what the culture, culture aspect is within that group. Uh, and then they're able to find, and one of the things that they're finding with success is over time, they're able to help make a difference with the, the culture within, within that group. And then that group can help build uh, within their, their school or their community uh, a positive um, influence around helping to eradicate gender-based violence. So I said before, as I said earlier, a small group of individuals uh, working in a in a locker room setting or in a in a school setting to help build a positive environment um, is really an amazing thing to kind of kind of sit back and and look at now. So when we get the opportunities to go in and see the the change that's happened over time, uh, it really is quite. Amazing, and I think that's what sport and the ability of of athletes bring um, to just everybody's individual. And you you had alluded to some of the things that you talked about, whether it's role definition, uh, whether it's working as a team, uh, whether it's uh, applying certain things that you learn in sport, and that's what the ambassadors have done, and then taking that and then build it to a positive uh, culture uh, within that group. So it's kind of been cool to to be a part of to see how that's kind of operated. That sounds so great. I have 63 follow-up questions, but I think we'll have to go to, um, you know, looking at, looking at the link to go to how you choose the group, training the group. And then um, it sounds like it's been really effective. So I know a lot of people watching are like, Hey, can we do that? And how can we do that um, in our team? Cause it sounds incredibly impactful when you tell someone you're a leader, you're a model that that can uh, make a big effect. So that sounds super cool. I'm glad it is working. We have a few more questions to hammer through so we can get to the Q&A. So thank you so much, Rick. Let's talk about storytelling. So from the shift report, men are more motivated to engage in prevention work when they can make a personal connection to the problem of violence against women. So it's more effective if we can engage men's emotions, build greater empathy, uh, increase men's willingness to address violence against women. And this should be done in ways that don't devalue women like was referenced uh, earlier, Jacob. How do you use storytelling in the male allies work you do with the Sexual Assault Support Center of Waterloo Region? And how do you do it? How do you do this in practice? Yeah, I mean, um, there's, there's a bunch of different ways and also some challenges. Um, in trying to make sure that we can have spaces to, to touch on or to have time for storytelling. And I'll try and get to that. Um, but to start out with, I mean, we work with, uh, you know, sports organizations at a, a local, provincial and national level, um, including, you know, the OHL, uh, Ontario Hockey League here, um, but also with our post-secondary institutions in town here, our high schools, elementary schools, and also sort of like in corporate settings. So there's lots of different places where we're going to be covering subject matter, and we're going to have to do it in slightly different ways. Um, and so creating spaces for 
both us as facilitators, but also for participants to share their own stories is a really great way to have uh, folks feel like they can connect to each other and, and learn from each other. Um, um, so in our in our programming, our, our sports program is called Leading by Example. Um, and you know, the things that we do in there is we we unpack the gender norms that uh, we have in our society. We talk about things like consent, we look at bystander intervention. Um, all which is really great, but it's, you know, folks don't always integrate that information as well if, if we're sort of lecturing them. Uh, so we try and integrate storytelling activities into all of those workshops um, so we can be connecting with those guys. Um, again, knowing that uh, when guys hear from each other, they're more likely to sort of integrate that uh, information into them into their own uh, sort of future actions um, and they can see the people around them in a different way which is always really nice and I think sort of our, my fellow panelists have sort of touched on some of those ways where that where that happens uh, whether it's sort of leaders on the teams sharing their experiences or whatever else um, so one of the ways that I do it is I talk about my own experiences and I sort of mentioned that in my introduction um, you know having played sports been in the locker room and you know um, witnessed hazing happening um, from a firsthand perspective, um, and you know get to share the experiences of while I watched the hazing happen, I was not an active bystander. I didn't step in and stop it because of my own fears that if I try to do anything about it, then I would be next. Um, but then also how I was lucky that one of the other guys on my team was looking out for me. And while he was on the team, I didn't get hazed because he was there and he was a well-respected guy. Um, and he was basically like, nope, you know, don't, don't touch Jacob. He's, he's off limits. And, you know, he, he told me eventually that it was because he had a crush on my sister. So it was like, maybe not the best reason, um, but uh, it's those dynamics that come up. Um, and by sharing these stories, we can sort of help sort of normalize and unpack some of these behaviors that, that happen. Um, and of course, it's interesting that guy left the team. And as soon as he did, you know, I got, I got hazed. Um, and, and then, you know, as a way to sort of regain my power and my own masculinity in that space, I then became the person who was hazing others. Um, and so it's, it's being honest about, you know, the, the spaces I've been in. Um, I think helps create the space for participants to then feel a little bit more comfortable to open up about some of the experiences that they may have had. And the fact is, when I'm talking to an, a, a sports audience about my experiences of hazing, um, it's it's amazing to see a group of guys who sort of, you know, they're all over the place, maybe not paying attention. As soon as I start talking about this stuff, the room goes silent. They're like, oh my gosh, somebody's finally talking about something that has impacted me, that I've seen, that I didn't know what to do about. And then we have that space to sort of open up that conversation. Um, and so, and it's, you know, the same thing when we have other folks who may be survivors of sexual violence. Some of my co-facilitators talk about their experiences, um, can, can really have a much bigger impact on, on some of the, the people in the workshop uh, to sort of more deeply integrate that information. Um, you know, I've had guys, similar guys come to several workshops in a row where we talk about things like cat calling and by the, you know, the third session, they're like, I still don't understand why cat calling is a bad thing. You know, these are 17 to 18 year old guys who are leaders in our community. They're, you know, done lots of amazing things in sports, but they haven't had that experience of understanding why cat calling might be harmful. Um, but as soon as we have somebody, you know, woman come and talk about their experiences of catcalling, how it makes them feel, um, whether it's as a facilitator or, you know, somebody in their own age group, um, it has such a, you know, a huge impact, a much different impact, and they're more willing to sort of see, see that information um, because they've heard it from somebody else rather than, you know, me um, from, the, from, from the front of the room. Um, one of the other places that we use the sort of, sort of uh, storytelling um, portions is when we go into scenarios. So, you know, we we have full two hour workshops on topics like bystander intervention and responding to disclosures. And again, we can lecture to people for that whole time because there's so much information uh, that we wanna go over. Um, but when we actually have time to go through into scenarios and we say, here's a, a hypothetical, hypothetical scenario, what would you do? 
Um, and then we give space for everybody in, in the workshop to respond. And, you know, there's no wrong answers, especially when you're doing responding to disclose or um, uh, bystander intervention. Um, you know, it's what's comfortable for you in any given situation, what makes you feel safe. Um, but it's an opportunity for those guys then to say, oh, he would do this in that situ situation. So much like was uh, mentioned earlier, you know, when those guys see that the other people around them aren't necessarily as misogynistic as, as we might think they are, they're like, oh, that guy actually does care and he would call this stuff out. He just doesn't feel safe necessarily. So it's creating that space where they can see each other as people who are more safe uh, to chat about things. Um, the last aspect I wanna to touch on in terms of how the, the storytelling works really well is when guys are able to talk about the experiences that they've had. Um, in a workshop I was running last year, uh, we had a hockey player talk about how um, how he was impacted when he was injured in the the, the semifinal of a championship run that they were on. He injured in the game, played through the game, um, but like realized he couldn't keep playing, and so he sat out the final. And it, it was really hard for him. He you know he worked so hard to get to this this place, and then one of his teammates you know called him a name. Uh, misogynistic name, basically calling him weak for not playing through his injury. And the fact that he was able to, like, he felt comfortable to talk about this openly. Again, you could see the guys be like, oh, I didn't realize it was having that much of an impact on other people, or it's always had that impact on me. I just didn't feel like I could talk about it. So it creates a space um, for, for the guys to, to talk about these things but also to see each other as humans um, and sort of deepen their, their, their sort of team um, camaraderie, much like Ninu, I think you were speaking about earlier, where the guys then are, are much closer as a team because they trust each other more. They're not worried that somebody's gonna come and say something negative behind their back when they can talk about these things. So I wanted to touch on a quick challenge with all of this stuff is that telling stories takes time. Um, as you can, like, I'm already trying to, not speak as long as I you know, could right now because I wanted to share some stories. Um, one of the biggest challenges that, that we have in running workshops with people is we are often not given enough time to get to the depth and to the level that we need to, to really let these guys unpack these things. Um, you know, we, we are regularly approached by sports organizations saying, can you come in and do a, a one hour workshop with our guys and that'll be good for the year and then they know everything about consent and masculinity, bystander intervention, all these other things. And, you know, that's the time we're given, they maybe don't have a big enough budget to, to bring us in for longer, um, or they just don't have time for, for whatever reason. But it does mean that it's really hard for us to actually spend the time to get these guys to open up. Like ideally we would have at least, you know, six hours with every athlete in any given season uh, to, to talk about some of these things and get into depth, but that's like a bare minimum. Um, and part of the challenge is a lot of organizations around the, around the country don't actually have the resources to have facilitators to run the workshops in the first place. So I know that when we work with the OHL, they say, well, none of the centers want to come and do, you know, do the work with us and run these workshops. It's like, well, none of the centers have enough staff to be able to run the workshops. Most centers like ours um, only have one educator for, for their large communities. So they don't actually have capacity to go in and spend the time to sort of open up and create space for all these stories to be told and all of the necessary unpacking that needs to happen in all these situations. So I just wanna use this opportunity to sort of remind everybody that Sports organizations need to much play a much bigger role in providing funding for education work to happen so that there can be trained educators to come in and work with your teams to do the work. Um, so when, you know, I would love to see all of the national sports organizations, every single, from every single sort of sports angle, be putting money in along with sponsors of those sports, along with federal provincial governments, putting money into a pot to, to fund uh, educators across the country. So. Solid uh, next step. If you're on the board, if you're on the admin, if you have seen a budget, if you are uh, privy to any of your organization's budgets, make that your next step. Let's talk about this. And I think from a value proposition standpoint, uh, the BC Lions won the Grey Cup after the training. The vulnerability, it's part of the team co cohesion. It's part of the psychology. It's part of injury prevention. It's part of athlete retention. 
So maybe we, you know, I think it's hard when you're in the space, you're doing excellent work. And then you also have to promote it is exhausting. <laughs> but I appreciate that that also, uh, that's a strong action that needs to be taken so that we can make the change and, and be aware. This is not a one hour workshop, that's for sure. Wow. Hey, Shandri, yeah, go for it. Can I just say really quick, one, one of the things when you talk about um, athletes that are engaging in, in certain work or teams that are engaging in certain work, a lot of it is because of if they can have these hard felt conversations and, and, and talk real talk and, and be open and honest with each other. Uh, it's real easy to, 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 to have discussions about making sure somebody's running hard on the backside of a route or making sure somebody's doing a cutoff block. And, and lots of times that's why they're going to be successful on the field is because they've had these hard feel, felt discussions and, and they've went to deeper places and just superficial. And, and, and so when, when, they, when they go to these places, it's real easy. The, the on-field stuff or on the court stuff or in the rink stuff, that's easy. To, that's easy. They've been doing that since you know, since they're little kids. It's some of the other stuff that um, takes a little while to, to understand and, and to have empathy or, or feel for what people are talking about. Right, and you're saying that it translates into results in, in actual 100, plays. 100%, 100%. Well, coming from you, I believe it. That's really meaningful because even at the top of the webinar, we were talking about our why for doing this. I mean, I care so much. I care, I love, I want marginalized people to have equal access and equity, but I also love winning. We can connect this to winning. And I think that's, I know that's something to ignore. We are going to um, go a question for uh, Ninu next, which is, yeah, I appreciate that connection. Uh, this is about how we, again, kind of the value proposition and, and the why, that deep why that builds motivation, but men need to be explicitly targeted in the interventions aimed at violence prevention, gender equality, diversity, equality, inclusion, making men more visible like we're doing today with our, our fantastic group, but uh, as part, a necessary part of the solution. Nina, could you speak to this recommendation in the shift report in your work, um, how we explicitly are targeting men in violence prevention efforts, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Chandra. Um, well, as I said earlier, um, I mean, I'm the only woman on the panel here with um, these three great men, like I said earlier, uh, amazing to have them as allies. I think it's important to recognize that women have been doing this work for centuries. You know, women have been in the forefront of uh, ending gender-based violence, bringing awareness to it. And I think, you know, as a feminist who's done this work for a long time, I got to say, I kind of got to call myself out, which is that I think for a long time, we, we, we didn't really want men to come in and speak about this issue. And I'm not, you know, speaking for all feminists, so I'm not sure that everybody would agree with me and that's okay. But I think to be self, you know, to do some self analysis, it was, you know, we weren't sure if we could trust men in leadership to really know what our issues were. And I think for me, certainly uh, having done this work and, and so I think when I got over that, <laughs> when I started to kind of think about like, look, um, you know, we are stronger together um, and, and men speaking to men is really important. Um, though this is an issue that has been kind of held up by women, um, as Jackson Katz often speaks in his um, talks, this is actually a men's issue. This issue he often, and that's what I really learned from him is that this is a men's issue and men need to speak to other men. And, and so to me, I think that's what the report talks about is bringing men into, um, you know, kind of standing out there and saying, this is our issue. And in order to end gender, in order to end violence uh, by men, because this is a historical issue, predominantly, um, disproportionately, men are the ones that have been using violence that has impacted women, non-binary folks, and other men, and other boys. So we know that this is a gender issue. And so it's important that men speak up. I just want to also take the space to say my second point, which is that um, we also don't want to demonize men. 
you know, this isn't about men feeling terrible about themselves, you know, that, you know, you are living in a patriarchal world, therefore you are part of patriarchy and misogyny, therefore, you know, we need to come and tell you how not to be all those things. I think it's important to recognize the inner good of the person. You know, it's important to start with the fact that everybody wants to do the right thing, but somehow the environment and the cultures we've created, we've created boys and we've created, you know, uh, girls, and we have left out anyone that's on the continuum of gender um, identification. Like that's just the world that we have created across the globe. So how do we disrupt that? And by disrupting it, we need to call in the good in us all. And I think that for me, that's the second part. And then the third part I want to say um, is that when men are doing this work, um, it's important to not educate them, but turn them into leaders. It's important even, it's not about, I'm not using leadership from a hierarchical structure, the systems we operate in, I'm the ED, therefore I'm a leader. No, everyone is a leader. So when we go into a, a classroom or we go into a high school assembly and we have our BC Lion players stand in front of them, they're going in there to say, you are all leaders. So you've got 150 students in a high school. We're going in there to really talk about their leadership. So I want to, I just wanted to deconstruct that word uh, leadership and and, and, and I'm so thrilled to see, um, you know, men doing this uh, work across uh, Canada. And I really want to do a shout out, similar to what Jacob said, I want to shout out that it's important to engage the women in your communities who've been doing this work. Men need to speak to men, but women need to be part of the work that you're doing because we, the feminist community, the women's community, the the intersectional community, we have lots of experience and knowledge. And I'm thrilled to see that, you know, the, 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 my, my, my co-panelists uh, have really been tapping into women uh, and standing alongside them as they're doing this work. Because we wouldn't want the fear of us feminists to, to really emerge and say, you folks are running off and doing this work when there's a lot of expertise that exist in your communities about women and and frontline work that's being done and you need to be able to let those who are being harmed by violence you need to be able to refer them to those community-based organizations where survivors are being supported thank you solid call to teamwork and really seeing that good in each of us that's that's that really resonates profoundly. And it actually segues to a question we got in the Q&A box. Um, during the calling in discussion, John talked a lot about the impact of having marginalized individuals, black athletes, women firefighters share their experience and how impactful that is for men and white colleagues. How do you balance having this be impactful for learning with the burden and responsibility that is placed on the marginalized individuals? There's a lot of discussion about uh, the burden placed on marginalized individuals and groups uh, rather than the responsibility of the privileged. How do you navigate this? This is actually a question for all panelists, so everyone can give give a comment on it, starting with John. Sure. So so I want to pick up just for a moment on something Ninu said is so important. Thank you. Uh, and it is great to have uh, the, the, the diversity on the panel today, is that it is very important that men talk to other men. That's why in our programs at whatever, in business with athletes, with uh, young men and boys and girls clubs, we want to create mostly dialogue-based programs, not programs that are preaching at, at you know, men or boys, because we want them to learn to talk to each other about these issues. And you know, the importance too of young men, especially having male role models in a time when uh, almost half of Canadian uh, young boys before university will not have a male living in the household with them. And they may have a completely absent father, but they literally will not have a male role model in the house. And uh, article just in the last day or so uh, in the Vancouver Sun about the dearth of male teachers, especially in elementary school, it's actually shrinking, not growing. So. The reason this is important is yes, and women, we do a lot of our work in team teaching with uh, 
female uh, team members. So totally believe that they need to see both, but we need men to talk to each other. And we also need them to see male role models. Now to the specific question that was asked, three quick responses. First, I completely agree that we cannot leave it to those who have been marginalized to tell their story. I need to say in all of our programs, and we, we're not really a program delivery organization, we test, we make sure something works, and then we share that with others. So our goal is to grow best practice and share that. Uh, and so we always have the right to pass as one of our norms. We never put people on the spot. Now let's hear you know, from those who've been marginalized about their experiences, you know, we always have the right to pass. These are always where people in the flow of things choose to share their story. The second thing is one of the most profound things we do in our program, and people want to know more, happy to share offline, is we do something we call the circle of inclusion. It's too, too complex for me to explain right now. But what we do is we help all people get in touch with their own experiences of exclusion, where they have felt not included in the circle, whether it was in a team, in a school, in their own family, in a society, and talk about what it was like to not feel you could get into the circle. And then we talk about what it's like when you're at the center of the circle, where often you're not even aware that people are not experiencing inclusion the way you are. So what we do is we try to say, if you wanna be a leader, your job is to be aware of where people are in the circle, to be curious about the experience others are having, whether it's other genders, other players. If you're a star, what's the experience of the people who are not stars? Uh, you know, If you are a, a male, if you're female, if you're older, if you're younger, if you're of a different race, what is the experience others are having? So to make a long story short, I think once we get people in touch with their own experiences of exclusion, and we've all had it, and then we know what that was like, and we think about what helped us be included. And also, we have a simple saying, when in doubt, check it out. If you feel Sim wasn't included in a joke you told, on the team, in a class, check it out. Say, my intention is for you to feel fully included. I'd love to know what you're experiencing one-on-one -on -one, and tell me how I can help you feel even more included. So curiosity comes when people get in touch with their own experiences of exclusion because then they remember and see how important it is. And no matter how privileged we may be as a group, we've all had experiences of exclusion. Once we tap into them, then we can start to be really curious about what others are experiencing right now and may have experienced their whole lives. That's an aha moment. Um, Jacob or Rick, would you like to add? We have another question in the hopper. So what, uh, if you want to add to uh, not put, placing the burden on marginalized uh, folks to share their stories. All right, well, uh, a lot of people have written their stories, have made podcasts, have like, we don't have to always ask someone to do it directly. There's a, a wealth of experiences that have been shared that are available to us across all mediums all the time. We'd have to go absorb it and listen to it and, and resonate with it deeply. Uh, and and fa face it as well, I often think of the expression, if they can live it, you can read about it. Yeah, I know it's hard, you're gonna do it. So that's for me talking to myself in the mirror. This one is for Rick. Do you think it would be possible to make these workshops mandatory on a continuous basis for athletes to attend in order to be part of a team? If this approach has been explored before, have you received any pushback? Are coaches part of the hazing problem? So two questions, mandatory workshops and uh, are coaches part of the hazing problem? Because this person uh, is the coach. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think mandatory workshops, um, I've always been a proponent uh, of uh, exposing um, uh, these type of uh, initiatives and workshops to individuals. Um, being on a team is is a, is a privilege. It's not a right. It's not a rite of passage. It is a privilege. And in order to be on that team, there's certain um, there's certain things that you must uphold to, and there's certain things that you must go through and understand. Uh, it is the the ultimate um, uh, kind of microcosm microcosm of the world, really. Uh, and depending on what the sport is, lots of times there's individuals from 
all kinds of different points, parts of backgrounds and, uh, and to be able to expose yourself to, to different learnings and different teachings, whether that be uh, modules on gender-based violence, whether that be modules on, on uh, socio, uh, socioeconomic things or modules on, uh, on, uh, on what social issues. I think those are all important aspects to, to being part of a team and, and to assisting you to transition to adulthood, really. Uh, so whether you're a, a young person, a mite, or whether you're a, uh, an NHL hockey player, these are all things that we should have to go through. Uh, so mandatory, absolutely, 100%. Um, from the coach's standpoint, uh, I, I would say that um, uh, there are times that coaches can be roadblocks to, uh, to moving the needle. Um, I, I think that uh, quite often that um, coaches grew up in, have grown up in a certain era and have probably done things a certain way, and they're probably used to doing it that way. And, and so sometimes it, it's a little bit outside of their necessarily their thinking of, of what it means to um, uh, what it means to 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 start to think and understand uh, what the new age athlete is looking at and would like to see and, and, and needs to have it in their life. Um, I think coaches, for the most part, are trying to do the best job that they can, but uh, uh, education has is always going to help them. Sometimes it might not be the first time or second time, uh, but it might be the third time that they hear something that uh, that resonates with them and, and that maybe it'll stick. So uh, my advice would be not to give up on coaches. Uh, they do, at the end of the day, want what's best for their players and their teams. Uh, they just might need to hear it more than once. Right on. A lot of nodding heads. Go ahead, John. Well, just a Rick, really good comments. To piggyback on, reinforce two things. Uh, to make it mandatory really requires that the coaches are in on it and committed. And one of our principles is the coaches should always go through at least some version of the experience their athletes are going through because they can't reinforce it if they're not experiencing it. And when we work with coaches at, at Stanford, one of the things that amazed me was these are high level, I'm mentioning Stanford, not to brag, but these are high level coaches. These are highly paid professional coaches. When we got them together and, and began dialoguing about how to get engaged in conversations about life with athletes, especially male athletes, with all athletes, these coaches were you know, uh, all genders. So many of them said, we never talk about this stuff. I wasn't trained to engage in life conversations. And so we, we need to remember coaches, even really highly skilled ones, often had very little training in this and don't spend a lot of time talking with other coaches about this. So I think we need to create lots of forums. And, you know, we personally have a companion program for coaches. We're happy to share that. I think it's just so important we not forget coaches because once the coaches are committed, like the UBC football coach, who's when the guys didn't show up, he would say, why weren't you at that session? This is as important as practice. But that won't happen if the coach, you don't work first with the coaches to make sure they're all in, not just ticking a box. Don't do a program if they're ticking a box. Win the coach's heart first, uh, then do the program. So much nodding. So in terms of prioritizing our effort, we have, you know, 24 Beyonce hours in each day, but you, you work on yourself, you work on your coaches, you, you get that time and that encouragement of it's worth it and, and all the resources we have here. We're going to work on these coaches. They're just so, so monumental in, in their impact, right? And, and so that makes a big difference. And I hear your empathy as well. Yeah, they didn't have training. That's fine. We're here now. Now we're going to go get some. Uh, this is 2023. Yes, Ninu. One thing I wanted to add to everything uh, my colleagues are saying is that in our Be More Than a Bystander, one of the things that we talk a lot about is tools. And, uh, you know, when you're trying to win the coaches or you're with, trying to approach any organization, anyone that is interested in bringing this work in, 
And I speak from our experience of going into male dominated industries where they, they're also interested in taking our programs. And so one of the fundamental parts of our Be More Than a Bystander program is that we leave in our training uh, very simple tools, which is how to intervene. Um, and so actually we train, it's a, it's a very part, key part of our curriculum. It, I think about half of our, any, any workshop that we do is about having um, questions back and forth about walking people through on what would you do with the, in this scenario and actually have people walk through that. And, and I think coaches and other leaders really like that when they feel that their people are going to be left with some tools like the how to. Like, yes, I understand. Yes, I'm bought in. It's important. And I think the storytelling Jacob talked about and the, uh, you know, the personal why are so critical because it sets the context. And, and I think as jo John says, you know, it really brings people in rather than calling people out. I love that idea. But it's important to leave some practical tools with people. And I think that's a that's a buy-in that as many of you who are in the room now that are listening to this podcast, uh, th this um, webinar, I think that to, to know that some of the trainings and all of us, I think, are focused on training where we will take your people through as to how to be more than a bystander. These are the very simple, 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 simple tools that you can use and, and um, you know, your players can go through, your coaches, your leaders. So I just wanted to bring the tools back into the room, um, Shander. Oh, fantastic, Con very concrete. And it makes sense, we're athletes, we're practicing. We're practicing for 10 years for one race sometimes. We're practicing everything over and over and over again. And, and uh, it makes so much sense to me that we could role play and practice what an intervention would look like that would make a world of difference and i will be seeking that out myself in my next steps everybody getting their next steps down because we are wrapping i know it's been an amazing time together and great job to 82 people all the way through we had 100 at the peak at solid attendance i know everyone here uh, we're probably preaching too much of the choir, so we're looking for ways to continue bringing others in, and I think that's what we've learned a lot about today. Let's make sure everyone's got a um, handle on your next steps. We want to thank our panelists. We can't thank you enough for your time and dedication to your craft uh, and what you're able to share with us today, but beyond that, the work you're doing day after day and decade after decade, hey? Let's have a call to action that you can, um, you can reach out to the organizations of the panelists. You can enroll in training and finding the tools. As Nina was saying, you can keep in touch, sign up for the monthly Pathways newsletter. In the next few hours, you'll get the digital handout. Make that a checklist, make that, a, I'm gonna make that a goal to click on every link in the checklist. It's going to have links to training, courses, reports, TED Talks, anything to spark more curiosity on the topic and then share that on to people in your network. You'll get the webinar recording in the next few days. Uh, let's see, let's see some pages up with your next steps. If you have any questions, please reach out to Veronica and Next Gen Men. One last huge thank you to our panelists, Ninu, Rick, Jacob, and John. Thank you all for attending today. Have a fantastic rest of your day. I hope you're filled with hope, seeing the good. And uh, I wish you all the best in your next steps on the journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dede. Great job, Chandra. Hey, you guys are awesome. Wow, we learned so much. Uh, brought my uh, naivety and ignorance about certain things. So, you know, just so people can relate. <laughs> so we're doing-